Okay, uh, let's start the first sharing in this session, is, which is presented by Lawrence, who is the Director, Solution Engineer at F5 Labs. Hello, Lawrence. Yeah, can you uh, unmute your mic microphone? Good. Hi, Eric. Good afternoon. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, how's your life? Treating you nice. good. Good. Very good. Okay, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, it's your time to show what is the zero trust uh, security with the surface match. Okay, thank you. So I, tr I try to, to go over what I have uh, to share with you today. Um, and after that, yeah, we're going to have some time to share a few questions and answers. But uh, just to start with, um, I'm Laurent, I'm the Director of Solution Engineering at Nginx. So we are uh, here covering a Asia from a technical perspective and bringing solutions to customers. But really what I want to do today is really make sure that I can really give you a glimpse of what Service Mesh uh, is and what it will bring uh, to you, to your environment, to your workflow, to your operations. But also, um, how to choose a right service mesh, making sure that you have, I would say, the right uh, approach uh, to um, pick a service mesh or to uh, turn on capabilities of a service mesh. And uh, of course, how to consider it from a zero trust perspective and which should definitely guide your choices and make you uh, pick the right solution and implement it uh, correctly in your environment. But before going into that, uh, we all know that today Kubernetes is really the, the one who is leading the charge when it comes to uh, orchestrate, orchestrate microservices, deploy application, run application in production. And that illustration is just to show it again. Um, we have a lot of solutions, a lot of tools to uh, deploy application, to face challenges. But sometimes there are also new things that we have to face, uh, new things that we have to address to make sure that the application is deployed with security, but also with uh, uh, the right approach from an operation perspective. So for that matter, there are a lot of things to consider, and Kubernetes doesn't bring all of the answers uh, to, um, to, the, to, the, to these questions. Kubernetes addresses a lot of aspects from a networking perspective. So we know that with all of the container networking interfaces, the plugins that we have, a lot of the capabilities from a networking perspective are addressed, routing, um, for, um, exposing application on, port, on ports, orchestrating, defining a, um, access lists. All of those things are provided by, by Kubernetes. And that really helps into deploying, I would say, complex scenarios and addressing complex networking challenges. But moving forward, what we are dealing with is mainly applications. And then, when thinking about applications, it's mainly L7 type of traffic that we are dealing with. So uh, we know by fact that um, Kubernetes is not really well equipped to deal with L7 type of traffic management. And therefore, when we have to um, address issues related to um, policy-based routing or service level access control or uh, SSL or MTLS, we now have to face and to seek for uh, new solutions or new tools to address these, these issues. And when we starting to, um, I would say, investigate those areas, this is where the service mesh uh, pops up and where we have to ask ourselves a few questions. So basically, what is a, a, a service mesh? It's mainly, I would say, a L7 type of uh, uh, traffic management and security, I would say, a tool or framework in a way that it will operate and hide a lot of, uh, I would say, complexity when it comes to uh, deploy sidecar proxies to uh, container services, when it will help in deploying, I would say, policy um, management, tra traffic policy management in the application, and of course, give uh, the relevant or a consistent view from a metric perspective uh, and a, a, a consistent view from a application health that we can really rely on. And as I said, it's not just a tool or a set of tools, but it's really, I would say, an approach with a lot of components which are put together uh, to simplify operation and to make sure that all of these components, all of these uh, uh, concepts are deployed and operated smoothly 
and and are not adding a lot of burden to the developers when they are rolling out application or new capabilities to their applications. Okay, so the the point is really to have something which is very close to the way that Kubernetes is working, and doesn't add again a lot of burden on, on top of things. So uh, in a nutshell, we could definitely say that service mesh are mainly there to help traffic management when it comes to uh, containers and microservices applications. Okay, so I hope with that that we clear what uh, a service mesh is, and from a graphical perspective, uh, if we if we look at how uh, traffic goes into a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, mainly where we have to deal with those uh, L7 type of traffic and, and logic. It's really when the traffic comes into uh, the, the Kubernetes cluster itself. And therefore, this is where we need to have something which is consistent all along the path from the gate of that Kubernetes cluster down to the service or microservice by itself. And all of those services and pods are communicating, I would say, with uh, uh, networking uh, attributes, uh, L3 to L4 networking attributes. So there is no, I would say, direct mapping with the L7 type of uh, taxonomy that we, we, we are using. And this is where the service mesh comes into play to put and to connect all of these pieces together to make sure that we have our application logic mapped to a networking logic. And this is where we, we definitely think that there is a, a real value in considering a, a service mesh and why it is something that usually goes after uh, uh, picking up uh, on Kubernetes clusters, uh, what we uh, have to consider as a second step when uh, migrating or um, uh, growing up with Kubernetes. So after speaking about service mesh, there are a lot of things to consider. Um, service mesh is not, like I said, just not a tool that you deploy and set and forget and uh, happy life, no. There are a lot of things to consider, but again, it usually depends as well on how you operate your application, how you uh, uh, deploy your application, how secure you want your application to be, um, uh, who operate uh, the infrastructure of your, your application. And again, uh, in some cases, we have seen environments or customers where um, deploying a service mesh has been a complete fail uh, because all of the component, all of the, the stakeholders we're, we're, we're not really, really uh, ready to embrace it. So a few questions uh, must be uh, asked before considering a service mesh. Are you fully invested in your uh, Kubernetes for your production environment? And that's really one of the questions that you should ask first, considering that uh, when you will embrace and when you will, you will uh, deep dive into Kubernetes, then you're going to have to face the challenges of having multiple um, uh, microservices which will need to communicate between each other and how to control those configurational aspects. Do you require as well a zero trust type of uh, production environment and need, I uh, would say, MTLS um, at some point? Uh, this is also something that you should ask uh, yourself. And uh, again, how and what solution to apply uh, in terms of how you will operate it, how your developer community can embrace it, how your security teams can, can embrace it, and make sure that all of these components can be deployed and operated, I would say, smoothly in the organization. And of course, when uh, uh, going further into Kubernetes and uh, orchestration of applications, there are aspects like um, having multiple, I would say, microservices, uh, my, multiple deployments talking to each other, and then uh, growing on top of that adds and adds more to the complexity by itself. Uh, starting from a set of microservices, which is around five, growing to something which is ar around 1,000 or 10,000 microservices, it's not the same complexity at all, and not the same management, which is, uh, which is um, uh, being the result of that as well. And after considering that, there is also one point not to uh, forget about, which is, um, how all that production uh, operation are, are, are executed uh, on a daily basis and how uh, mature you are with your CICD pipeline, meaning that uh, do I do one deployment a day or one a week or multiple a day or multiple people are um, uh, issuing a new rollout uh, or, or during the day and must this deployment be compliant with what I'm I'm, I'm uh, instructing uh, to everyone uh, along the path. So those are questions which definitely could help 
in considering a micro um, a service mesh and making sure that you're making the right choices when considering uh, this type of technology. And as I said earlier, um, are you deploying uh, once in a while or multiple times a day? Uh, these considerations are really impacting the way that you will um, insert security in your application, the way you will, you will get the, the application health uh, up to date and consistent, the way that you're going to have the metrics uh, reported uh, consistently across the different parts of the application, uh, be it on-prem, be it on private cloud, be it on multiple different clouds, all of these aspects needs to be uh, taken uh, into, into account. So for that as well, um, as I said, it's not just having the right tooling, but it also having the right people to operate the application. So how your DevOps team is ready to uh, use these, uh, these frameworks and use these uh, uh, technologies to make a be the best use of it, the best possible use of it. So again, uh, uh, networking people and application people or security people will have different requirements. But uh, for that sake, you, you might have to have a, a, a tool which kind of addresses all of these aspects. So uh, you simplify the whole streamline and the whole operations uh, along the application. So selecting a service mesh really is something that um, um, I would say influx the way that um, the applications are being rolled out and the way that the services are being operated and the way that you see a lot of things are, 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 are out of your uh, microservices application. And um, uh, the first question is, what can bring a service mesh to my uh, organization? So first, a service mesh could definitely address multiple uh, benefits and use cases. First, um, we mentioned it earlier, but the security is one of the uh, prime uh, uh, strongest attributes of uh, a service mesh. Making sure that services are talking to each other into an encrypted manner is one thing. Making sure that uh, a service is allowed to communicate to a certain set of services and not to another is another uh, point which is also very important to address. Orchestrating all of these deployment of technologies, so we mentioned a sidecar by themselves, uh, it's not something that must add a, another set of burden on top of the developers or the platform operators. Uh, it's something that must be integrated as much as possible and as smoothly as possible to the Kubernetes uh, uh, native APIs and to the Kubernetes flow, uh, if I may. And considering that uh, with that uh, L7 type of approach, we need to handle the traffic uh, for all the application. How do we make sure that we address every type of traffic and we uh, apply and we can definitely allow any type of deployment or any type of operation inside a Kubernetes cluster. So load balancing, circuit breaker, blue-green deployment, rate limiting, authorization, uh, all of those aspects are things that uh, you need to inherit at the application level. And again, not to uh, add a lot of complexity when you want to add that to your application. And as I said, again, it's still required to see what's going on, to have a proper dashboard to have the proper metrics to understand what's going on from a real-time perspective. And again, have something which is consistent, not for a specific uh, cloud environment or specific uh, platform, but for the, uh, for the whole, I would say, ecosystem uh, uh, composing uh, the application. How will you use the service mesh? And that really um, uh, goes to um, the point of who operates uh, those uh, platforms, those uh, um, services. Uh, is, is, is that deployed and, and operated mainly by the developers, or is that mainly uh, operated by the pl platform or infrastructure teams? Uh, these two questions are also really uh, important. The way that uh, that will, um, I would say, um, automate or embrace or hide a lot of the aspects which are needed to have a proper service mesh deployed uh, in your application. So again, uh, if you uh, focus on the security attributes of a service mesh, uh, is it really uh, the security, uh, the developers to uh, take care of it? Or, or, or does it have to be, I would say, smoothly integrated uh, on, on uh, respecting the, 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 the asks that the security teams have uh, expressed uh, for that? Um, um, if we, we consider the platform or infrastructure team, uh, is that really something that they could definitely, uh, um, I would say, 
uh, insert into their CI/CD pipeline. So uh, it's um, really deploys all of the components as smoothly as possible alongside all of the application which which are being uh, rolled out. So um, that being said, uh, as I said, there is a there is a a, a, um, a question to ask yourself as well, which is uh, is security and specifically zero trust is a really important uh, criteria to take into account when uh, picking or selecting a, um, a service mesh. And for that, let's dive a little bit into what a zero trust uh, approach is and what it is when it comes to service mesh. So um, zero trust security is really something that we see more and more uh, coming as a concern for most of our uh, customers, most of our a platforms operator, and I would say um, uh, moving forward, we see that there there are many questions about uh, um, who should operate this type of technologies, uh, um, what the risks uh, which are associated to to, um, to deploying application without taking care of security, and we see that there are um, a lot of uh, data reported on the cost of security, the cost of data breaches. Uh, the average time to uh, discover uh, a security uh, security breach and to discover the, the, the root cause of that security breach. And when, when considering uh, microservices uh, with the, the, the flow of container images which are pulled in, pulled out uh, all the ways, it, make, it makes the whole process more way more complex. And of course, uh, now we know that uh, uh, attacks are usually laid in time for in time for quite some some some, some time because all is being done uh, online and we know that when uh, dealing with microservices the complexity uh, is quite huge meaning that things are uh, way more difficult to identify and to track back uh, um, in order to identify any any attack so there are many networking principles uh, attached to Azure Trust, and uh, there are a few of them that we should definitely um, um, aim for when um, deploying application and making sure that they are secure uh, as much as possible from the from the ground up. And uh, the first one is to make sure that um, uh, networking uh, networking are not networks are not safe by, by, by default. So making sure that when someone is entering a network, I need to make sure that that person is really uh, a friend that I would allow to enter my network and not to uh, get the, the door fully open to that to that network. Um, making sure that someone who is in the network or just uh, alongside a network uh, is, is trustworthy is not really something that uh, you also consider when um, thinking about zero trust. You also have to make sure that you um, add multiple criteria or multiple uh, signals, let's say, to identify someone who wants to enter enter your 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 own networks. And one of the strongest principle of zero trust is to make sure that every device, every request, every user uh, has to be uh, authenticated or authorized. Meaning that again, uh, I must not see any request coming from uh, anywhere, going to anywhere in my network without any attribute to identify uh, who is issuing that request, where that request is coming from. For that, uh, network policies are also a good tool uh, when uh, thinking and speaking about uh, service mesh, uh, just because, again, that restricts the way that traffics are flowing inside the, the cluster by itself and making sure that uh, uh, if we go beyond the cluster, it's all uh, how the traffic is going through the networks by themselves. and. Zero trust, those principle plus service mesh really, I would say, helps you uh, limit and restrict many possibilities of attacks in your environment. For instance, making sure with the service identities that service mesh provides that all of your services are protecting from uh, impersonation are things which are uh, valuable and really important to consider. Uh, making sure that uh, you have proper identification and our back. Uh, implemented in your uh, application and in your uh, operation platform uh, also makes helps you uh, make sure that uh, no one is accessing anything from your uh, application environment without being uh, granted privileges to do to do so. Uh, having a, a proper network policy uh, also uh, 
reduces the risks that people could exfiltrate data without you noticing or being alerted that something is being uh, used or some traffic is going out of the Kubernetes cluster or out of the network be, without knowing it. So uh, for that matter, there, are, there is also one thing that um, uh, service mesh are really useful and I would say um, we see our customers picking up uh, the topic um, at the first sight with um, uh, the MTLS attribute. Uh, the first, I would say, answer when we um, talk uh, about service mesh to a customer, the first uh, question is about the MTLS. How can I make sure that the traffic is encrypted uh, uh, between services? And that definitely helps because we know in a cluster, the network is a flat network and therefore anything could happen on that flat, flat, flat network. So there is a need to uh, protect as much as possible traffic uh, going through that, that cluster. And dealing with TLS and MTLS uh, is not something simple. You have to man manage a certificate authority, deploy certificate, client certificate, ser certificate here and there. And, and dealing with that with one server or two server is I would say an easy task, but dealing with thousands of services is something which is uh, much more complex. Therefore, a service mesh really helps in simplifying and operating these kind of capabilities, having a central management to have uh, this principle uh, deployed and having also the tooling to update it. Because again, security is not just a, a, a one-stop uh, uh, trip, I would say it's a journey. So you have to renew your key, you have to have uh, a, a look on, on what's going on and and therefore you need to have the proper tooling to do that easily and again not to uh, add a lot of burden on top of of the developer so for that matter i would say um, um i spoke about that around in the uh, context of nginx but nginx do provide all of those um, um capabilities and um of course being able to run application as containers, uh, reverse proxy, API gateways. Uh, these attributes are things that you could definitely benefit from. And just to help you identify uh, those areas where you could use that technology and, and what benefit you could uh, get from it, uh, we, we, we invite you to scan the QR code, which is uh, displayed here. So you could have a, a, a um, I would say, assessment of your application stack. And with Intent Manager, have a, a view of how ready you are some, somehow to uh, embrace the um, um, service mesh journey and possibly add security and address all of this as smoothly as possible. So with that said, um, I hope that you have um, a, a better understanding of what a service mesh is and how it could help you in deploying a zero trust in infrastructure. And you could find me uh, on LinkedIn. You could also download that um, a booklet to have some more information. And with that said, uh, Eric, I will open it for Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, run question. Uh, after applying uh, uh, surface mesh for security control, that facilitates the, let's say, the different effort or management overhead for the microservice uh, on the microservice platform, let's say the Kubernetes. But some of us are afraid that the performance degradation of the API, that means if we add an additional layer, the sidecar layer, or some control planes in it. Is it true? If yes, how to mitigate it? Do you have any suggestion to us? This, this is where there are, I would say, a plethora of service meshes uh, implementation and a lot of performance re reports, which are also um, um, written or tests which are done. And there are public uh, information available uh, showing the footprint of each sidecar proxy by themselves and the latency that they add on top of the other traffic. So when it comes to um, API gateway, one of the uh, metric and one of the concern that we uh, ask the, 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 the customer to think about is the latency induced by those API gateways. And so far we have good, I would say, uh, results of the testing that we, that we do at Nginx and uh, having the success uh, of Nginx as an API gateway just shows it by, by fact that the latency induced is the, the, the least one. And this is why in the service mesh that uh, Nginx has deployed, we picked Nginx as the SAT car, just to make sure that we're not adding more latency that, than we've heard in the environment. 
Well, that's great with the, the Nginx, yeah. I think that the time is almost up and thanks for your time to share more about the security of the Surface Match. Yeah, thanks for sharing Thank you. today. Thank you.